Okay, we are ready to discuss the Jaratinsky equality after quickly looking at equilibrium statistical mechanics. So you already know what a prob probability density Px is. Let me repeat. Uh, it's a function on phase space, which is non-negative, normalized. And if you integrate this over any region in this phase space, then it gives you the probability that you find x in this region s. Okay, that's that's a probability density in general. And a very special but important example of a probability density is called the canonical distribution. If a classical system described by this Hamiltonian Hx is in touch with heat path with temperature beta inverse in the thermal equilibrium, then its behavior is in certain sense uh, described by this probability density. Okay. And here, z beta, this normalization constant is called a partition function, and it is related to the Helmholtz re free energy by this relation. Beta, beta is, of course, the inverse temperature, and I usually set the Boltzmann constant to be one. Uh, this is inserted, but uh, actually we had one over beta here, but that was just a mistake, so you should remove it. I did. Okay, that's all we need to know about statistical mechanics for the moment. And now I'd like to motivate the Jartinsky equality by considering adiabatic operations in thermodynamics. Okay, by adiabatic, I do not mean that we do slow operation. Adiabatic means uh, heat cannot go through this wall, for example. Okay, so suppose that we have this adiabatic container and inside we have a gas in thermal equilibrium, say with volume V. And outside here is probably you, who is an ex external agent who performs mechanical operation to the system. For example, this agent or you can pull the piston to change the volume. So this is an adiabatic operation in thermodynamics. And as I already stressed, uh, usually, uh, even if you start from equilibrium, you go through a non-equilibrium process if you move piston, okay? So, and the, and the a quantity that we are interested in is this W, which is the work done by the system to the external agent during this process. External agent is some, somebody who is, uh, who, who, who can measure the, measure the force. And so it, it's a mechanical, mechanical object, mechanical existence. So it can measure the force and it can compute the work that the system performed to the outside world. So this is our central quantity to look at. And I also want to review, uh, re remind you what, about one form of the second law of thermodynamics, which is called Planck's principle. And I take the same setting and consider an adiabatic operation, but uh, in but a cyclic operation. That means you start from, if you start from volume V and then at the end, and you can pull the piston, but again, you push it or you can push, but you pull, you do, you can do this, but finally you have to return to the same volume. Okay, that's, it's called a cyclic adiabatic operation. And the second law, Planck's principle says that the work in this cyclic adiabatic operation that the system has done to the outside world, W, is non-positive, okay? You cannot extract positive work by doing a cyclic adiabatic operation to the system. Yeah. That's called Planck's principle. Okay, now let's go to microscopic setting. We, we, we are going to discuss this in, in, in the setting of non-equilibrium statistical mechanics. So we consider mechanics. We consider a system of n classical particles, and this is a phase space. Now we want to discuss adiabatic operation to this system, but actually it's easy because in mechanics, we do not have the notion of heat. So we can simply consider a mechanical system. Then that automatically gives you an adiabatic system. So uh, let, let H alpha be our Hamiltonian. So here alpha is a control parameter, a controllable parameter that characterizes this Hamiltonian, okay? And this, uh, and this can be just a number, but uh, let's say that it takes value in R to the new. New can be one, two, or three, something like that, okay? And one example with, that we considered was the, the volume, 
of the system. And you can do it in this way. You can realize this control of volume this way. For example, consider this very simple but general Hamiltonian. Uh, there's no magnetic field, for example. And here's the interaction between particles. But here is an external potential uh, common to all the particles. Okay, And suppose that this has this kind of shape. And then by changing this potential, you can effectively control the volume. Okay, volume can be uh, realized, okay, this container can be real realized as, an, as a boundary condition, but you can also forget about boundary condition and just consider this kind of potential. Then if, if this is very high, uh, particles can essentially live in this region, okay? And if you want to increase the volume, you change this potential slowly not necessarily slowly, but you can change this potential like this, then this is basically the same as enlarging the volume, okay? So this, we have a potential, no, no, we have a Hamiltonian with this controllable parameter, okay? And now here is an, here's an external agent, probably you who uh, moves the piston. And this external agent in this setting varies alpha, this parameter alpha, according to a fixed protocol. A fixed protocol means a fixed function of t, where t is between zero and tau. So this this you know uh, tells you how you want to move this piston, and you decide how you how you are going to move the piston before you do you perform experiment and you fix your function. Okay, and then when experiment starts, you change alpha exactly according to this protocol. And I write, I denote by alpha the initial value of this alpha and alpha prime, the final value of this alpha, okay? And now since alpha is time dependent, through time dependence of alpha, uh, we get a time dependent Hamiltonian H alpha T of X. And here T is between zero and tau. And now uh, we can consider, we, we can consider corresponding time evolution operator T of tau. Again, I'm saying all the all the time, but uh, in general, you can never compute this function, but anyway, it exists, okay? So this is a basic setting. And now uh, uh, these are the, the same. And now our essential object is the work done by the system. Now, uh, suppose that the initial state of the system is X. And then since the initial parameter is alpha, uh, initial energy of the system is given by this, h alpha of x. Now, uh, at time tau, at the final moment, the, uh, the state of the system is given by this, right? And the parameter is this. So this is the, the final energy of the system. And these two energies may be different. Where did the difference come from? Of course, there's nothing else. Uh, you or the external agent uh, perform the mechanical operation to the system. So this difference uh, go, went to you, the external agent. So this difference is precisely the work that the system has done to the external agent during this operation, okay? So this is the exact uh, definition. This is the definition of the work. Here is a remark. Here is a very simple remark. Uh, sometimes it is, un not very realistic to imagine that you can perfectly control alpha t, right? Uh, for example, if you want to con uh, control the position of the piston, but you know, if if gas suddenly freezes, then you can, it's very hard to move the wall or piston. So in that kind of case, uh, you can put, you can insert a spring here, and you can think about controlling the position of this end of spring. Uh, exactly according to the protocol that you have fixed. And in this case, uh, it's, it's not impossible to control this as you, as you uh, fixed in advance. So, uh, and in this case, you consider you treat this part as a system and everything is the same. Okay, this is a simple remark. Okay, now uh, I'm going to discuss Jarzinski equality that was uh, derived by Chris Jarzinski in 97. And now, uh, what do we want to do? Now, we want to consider this kind of situation. We start from thermal equilibrium and make an adiabatic operation. Now, we are treating microscopic system. Uh, we, we are dealing with microscopic description. So the uh, we can safely assume that the initial state is distributed according to the canonical distribution. Okay, The canonical distribution for the initial 
parameter alpha. Okay. And we know that this is the work, uh, the work that the system has done to the outside world, to the external agent. Okay, now we consider the average of this quantity, e to the beta w. And this x hat, this, this simply indicates that this is a random variable, so you can ignore this. So what we are, we are considering is this. We are interested in this quantity and we want to make an, we want to consider its average expectation value. And since this is a function of x initial state, uh, we can simply average this by using this canonical distribution. Okay, now uh, you recall this form of exponent uh, canonical distribution and you also plug this in here. And then you find that this part from the Boltzmann factor and this part cancels, okay? Uh, that's why we consider this. So after cancellation, we get this. Now comes a very non-trivial part. Uh, as now we fix tau and this is the initial state and this is a state at time tau, but you consider this as a change of variable, okay? Uh, we are describing the phase space, first of all, using this x, but you, 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 you think about it describing the phase space by using this new coordinate x prime, okay? And that is, of course, possible because this is one-to-one -one map, and this integration becomes a new integration with respect to x prime. And usually you need a Jacobian here, but we know from Liouville's theorem that the Jacobian is one. So this is the identity, non-trivial, but this is an identity you get from Liouville's theorem. Now, here you see a very simple integration. This, is a sim this simply gives you the partition function for alpha prime. So written in terms of the Helmholtz free energy, uh, this simply becomes this. Very easy, but you get something non-trivial. This is the Jaltinsky equality. E, the average of e to the beta w is exactly equal to this. And it's exponential e to the beta and the difference in free energies. And, you know, I'm not saying that this is nearly equal or this is upper bounded. This is an exact equality. And this is valid for any system. A system can be large in which we expect to have thermodynamical behavior, or it can be very small. You can even consider a system consisting of two particles or one particle. And you, you never expect thermodynamic, thermodynamics from this two particle system, but still, this is, an, this is correct. This is an exact identity. And you can also consider any process it can be a very slow process in which the state is very close to thermal equilibrium, or you can consider very fast process in which state differs very much from thermal equilibrium. But in any case, this is exactly correct. Uh, isn't this surprising? I was surprised when I saw this first time, okay? And so I would say, oh, and this is one remark, You even though, we started from the equilibrium state with alpha at, and at temperature beta, inverse temperature beta, and you got this free energy here, but you know, the final state is in general not the equilibrium state at beta inverse, okay? But still, you get this. In any case, in any case, you get this. So re this represents a non-trivial and surprising property of the work that holds universally, universally in non-equilibrium process. Okay, this is Chajautinsky equality. And of course, uh, this depends on the assumption. And very important assumption is that the initial state is given by the canonical distribution. Yes, that's it, that, because this is exactly canonical distribution, this cancellation happened, okay? But anyway, uh, with this assumption, this is correct. So yeah, this is a surprising, interesting relation. And, uh, we consider this Hamiltonian mechanics case, but there are there are various extensions. And in part three of this lecture, we, we're gonna discuss the Jaltinsky equality in, uh, in the setting of a stochastic process that mimics isothermal processes. Okay, so since this is just part one, I want to discuss briefly one application of this inequality, this equality, that is the second law of thermodynamics. So more precisely, uh, an inequality that can be interpreted as the second law, okay? Uh, there is an inequal inequality called the Janssen's inequality, which we are going to discuss in part two, uh, which says that 
in general, which says that uh, this kind of average, you know, e to the beta average is upper bounded by e to the beta w average outside. Okay, this is a general inequality in probability. And here we have the Jaltinsky equality. And then you compare here and here to get this rigorous inequality. Okay, and this holds uh, under our assumption. Okay, now we are, I, I, uh, I already discussed, but one form of the second law is called Planck's principle. And it says that the work done by thermodynamic system in any cyclic adiabatic operation is not positive. And this property is sometimes called passivity, okay? And to discuss a cyclic adiabatic operation, we are considering here the work done in an adiabatic operation uh, that in which parameter goes from alpha to alpha prime. So we only need to set alpha equal alpha prime, and these are the same, and this becomes zero, and then you get this inequality. This is precisely the Planck's principle, okay? But of course, of course, uh, this applies to any system, as I already said. So this is true for a system with two particles. In 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 that case, uh, this is this does not correspond to thermodynamics. But of course, this this is valid for the system for for systems with ten to the twenty third particles. And in that case, we do expect that this system exhibits thermodynamic behavior. And in that case, this inequality is precisely the second law of thermodynamics. Okay. Here is one remark. Uh, this inequality was proved before Jaltinsky, um, for example, by Lenard in 1978. And that was not only early, but that was more general. In Lenard's theorem, uh, the same statement is proved for any initial distribution written in this way, where f is a any non-increasing function of energy. So in, in our case, f turned out to be, uh, in, in the canonical distribution, if you if you choose f like this, then this gives you the canonical distribution and you recover our, this result. But this Lenard's result is much more general and it's based on a very interesting mathematical technique called plagiarization. Okay, so that's all for this part.